Righty ho, I never thought I'd have to make this video, but here we go. Um, since people have now started burning down 5G communication towers because of the misinformation that is being spread by certain selected parties that are either looking for an ego trip or to make money out of conspiracy theories, it's now necessary to cover 5G death beams and why they're not quite the 5G death beams they're being made out to be. So let's start with 5G. What does it actually mean? It means fifth generation. You see, since the dawn of telecommunications, there have been multiple standards set for the communication from your mobile phone to the remote sort of uh, the remote tower, cellular tower. In the early days, it was really simple. It was analog signal. It was really expensive. It was really high power. The thing was an absolute massive brick. I had one of those early phones and it transmitted huge amounts of power to that remote station and generally dropped the call and cost quite a lot. But things have evolved greatly since. And they've gone through the original one. They've gone through 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now they're up to 5G. And it's worth mentioning that this the tiny little box here uh, is very typical of the little uh, remote things that you can put a SIM card in and you get trackers and things like that. And it uses 2G. It's worth mentioning that as they move further into the different spectrums to make space in the, the post, they're getting rid of the old 2G stuff. So some of the 2G stuff in many areas is going to start working. So if you're specifying you... Uh, Cellular controlled equipment start with 3G. Anyway, I digress. I've digressed already. Let's take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum because it's quite important. But the to go back on the 5G here, it basically covers the old 3G and 4G standards, but it extends up to 300 gigahertz. But that's not going to be transmitted to us and our phones because it's really, really impractical, as will become clear in a moment. So let's take a look at this chart of the electromagnetic spectrum, which you can download conveniently from Wikipedia. It's credited Victor Blakus, Blacus, Blasus, Blasus. I'm not really sure how to pronounce that name, but Victor, thank you for creating this chart. It's very, very useful and thorough. OK, it starts with the early days of radio communication and the waves, because electronics couldn't really deal with the sort of high frequencies back then. Because they were very simple oscillators, really, uh, it starts off with a very long wavelength of roughly 10 metres. Uh, I'm trying to equate that to feet. Uh, one metre is going to be about... Uh, hold on, do I have a measuring tape here? I do have measuring tape. One metre is... Let me just do a quick calculation for you. Uh, one metre is... 39 inches, so just over 3 feet. So 10 metres is over 30 feet. So it's quite a long wavelength. And that was fine in the old days for AM radio, amplitude modulated radio. All it needed to do was provide fairly low quality audio. That was fine for that at the sort of speed of the, the, these radio uh, signals are transmitted, the electromagnetic spectrum. As the frequency went up, uh, they were able to transmit more data and ultimately they ended up uh, round about the one meter region that they were able to transmit enough information on those the waves to actually uh, send television pictures. And it's interesting that they call a big section about microwaves. And it makes me wonder, is it because after they'd gone through uh, long wave, medium wave and short wave type things like that, they didn't ever expect to get into this region, but as it is, they did. And microwaves is quite a prominent sort of section of the spectrum here. And to put things into perspective, uh, although the new communication standard goes up to 300 gigahertz, which is coincidentally about one millimeter. It's really interesting that it just stops short, that it starts moving into the infrared section of the spectrum. At this point, it's worth mentioning radiation. Now, you often hear of energy radiation, uh, broadcast radiation, your mobile phone emits electromagnetic radiation. What they actually mean is it's radiating energy. As in the this part of the spectrum is visible light, a visible light is radiation. Don't mix it up with gamma radiation from nuclear bombs, things like that. It's completely different. A light bulb radiates light. Your body, oh, here, I can prove this. See where it says uh, thermal infrared? Here's a thermal infrared picture of me I took just before starting this. This is me radiating energy in the electromagnetic spectrum as heat. 
Uh, I'm not actually dead. That uh, is the wavelength. Uh, that temperature, 31.9 degrees Celsius, is uh, due to emissivity, thermal camera emissivity of skin and things like that. It's complex. I shouldn't really div diverge into other areas. I should keep going where I'm going. Anyway, the area that... Uh, as an example, that three in the UK, three is a communication provider in the UK that is just really progressive. They've always been at the cutting edge as far as I'm concerned. They're a real provider, a real sensible provider. Their frequency range is going to be in the 3.4 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz region, which I would say is going to be round about here. I'm kind of semi-guessing here without actually checking things up. Actually, no, it's not. It's going to be uh, 2.4 gigahertz is roughly 10 centimeters. So they're going to be, and 5 gigahertz would therefore be about there. So they're, they are effectively going to be in this region here with that. And that's the frequency they're going to be communicating with your phone because that's a, uh, it, there's a problem with going higher in frequency because as it goes higher in frequency, the, the energy gets more directional and it has less penetrating power. Back in the old days of television signals, uh, let me bring down, let me bring down a bit of paper here. Back in the old days of television signals, if this was a, a city with all the buildings, with their antennas and so on, it was quite acceptable back then to build a great big tower and just beam the uh, the radio and television signals down and everybody did little antennas or it would actually, because it was fairly low frequency, it would enter in, you could actually have a TV in the room and it would pick up the signal. The lower frequencies have very good penetration. I'm just going to tame this image just a very tiny little bit. However, as you go up the spectrum to higher frequencies, that doesn't work anymore. Because this also worked with uh, cellular systems that, you know, they just went for, in the early days, they just went for a few remote towers dotted around the city. And wherever you were, it would actually just increase the signal strength to be able to communicate with that tower. And that's also important because 5G operates at much, much lower power, potentially, than 3G, 4G or 2G. But um, the... Problem is that with the higher frequencies, it doesn't have that penetrating power. So instead, what they have to do, and this is where three are onto a winner because they were always operating a system like this. If this is the city, instead of having the remote uh, beacon dealing with the whole city, they ended up having to have little tiny beacons mounted in the side of buildings. And you'll see them just dotted about, hidden, disguised as flag posts and things like that, and little boxes in the side of buildings. And they just emit very low power at high frequency between the buildings. And it means that uh, it not only reduces the amount of power that's required, which is safer. And it means your phone's going to require much less power to actually transmit to these little beacons. But it means because there's more of them, instead of everybody having to send their data, their internet data over one uh, beacon, it's actually divided between lots of small beacons, which may, means that there's much higher, potentially higher data throughput in that. So lots of advantages to doing it this way. Three have always done it that way. That's uh, They don't even support the 2G system. If you've ever got a little gadget like this and you've put a 3 sim in it in the UK, it probably didn't work because they can only start at the 3G network and upwards. They can't support the old 2G standard. It's also worth mentioning here that if you were in one of these buildings and you were using the older standard, what actually happens is your phone will... If it's well within these buildings or there's buildings blocking the path of the signal, what it'll do is it'll try and find a local cell, uh, the local tower. And if it's really in a congested area, you know, it's not good for the radio signal get, signals getting through, it will just keep boosting its power up. And it's got a limit. It will keep boosting its power up because it tries to communicate with the minimum power possible. But it will just keep boosting up until it finally gets a connection. And the worst I've ever come for that was actually my brother's place here in Isle Man. He lives in a valley and uh, he's down the valley and uh, the tower, the local cell tower is on the outside that valley. And he gets the lightest bouncy signal off that. And I've noticed that not only is the battery life a lot shorter on the phone when you're over there, but I found out the hard way when I was recording a video called uh, Mr. Bun Bun's Tragic e Easter. Um, 
where a chocolate bunny exploded. I recorded that, but I, the phone I was using was my normal phone. And because I plugged in an extension microphone, it was transmitting at such high power, trying to find that local tower, that it actually swamped the audio with actually that sort of did did it did it did it did it that you get off the old digital standards. That's not going to happen so much in the modern standards. That's a, a diversion. Let's put that down there. Anyway, as the uh, frequency increases up past those uh, signals, oh, there's another thing I want to mention. People seem to think that microwaves, they associate with the microwave oven in the same way they associate radiation with nuclear radiation. They associate the word microwave with the microwave oven. The only thing that's connected there is the microwave oven uses 2.4 gigahertz. Let's put that as 2.4 gigahertz. It's round about there in the spectrum. And there's another device in your home that also uses 2.4 gigahertz. That's your Wi-Fi router. Oh, it's also uh, looking around, looking around for phone. It's also your phone that communicates the Wi-Fi router at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. And it's also your laptop that communicates at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz with the router or router. Um, router in Britain, router in America. So it's worth mentioning 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz is exactly the same frequency as your microwave operates at. One of those devices is designed for cooking roast potatoes and the other is designed for communicating with your computer and transmits much lower power. One transmits thousands of watts, one transmits milliwatts. Another example of that would be to compare a 100 watt light bulb, which emits light in that broad spectrum. It actually, it, this light broadcasts light all down this spectrum, whereas this LED is just a few wee spikes through the spectrum like that. But this uh, 100 watt light, uh, emits light in the spectrum. If you put it against your skin, it would burn you. But if you put something that just transmits at milliwatts, but the same electromagnetic radiation, you're not going to even feel it pressed against other than just the fact you're jabbing yourself with an LED. So that's to put things into perspective. Just because it says microwave doesn't mean it's actually cooking food or your brain. Quite the opposite. Let's go further up here. In fact, you know, you could say that the microwave up and op operates at thousands of watts. If you have the green, a source of green out the visible spectrum, like a laser rated a thousand watts, it's going to do quite a lot of damage to you as well. So uh, it's all about power. And in the case of the phones, the power is very, very low. So the frequency goes up, it goes through thermal infrared, it goes through the infrared that can be used for CCTV, night vision, uh, remote controls, uh, the near infrared, which is starting to glow as red. It goes through the visible spectrum, starting at deep red, going through orangey red to yellow to green to turquoisey, and then blue, and then it goes into the violet. And this is where it starts getting dangerous. Here's the danger zone here. As soon as it goes above this point, the length, the wavelength is so small that it can start interfering with molecular structures and things like that. And it can start interfering with the cells. It can start interfering to a degree with the DNA. And this is the point that you get the UVC light that is used to, it's used as a germicidal thing. It's used to kill bacteria and viruses and things like that. I featured that in recent videos. And as it goes beyond that frequency, it takes on a completely different characteristic. It goes to x-rays, which can go right through your hand, uh, destruct, still cause a lot of damage, and gamma rays, which is the particles that literally, they go through you, but they're going through you all the time. It's just ambient radiation, but you wouldn't know it. But in large enough doses, they can physically cook your, your hand. So uh, this is... Um, this is the danger zone above here. It's predominantly in here is the area that is the scariest, a certain section of the ultraviolet zone, because uh, that uh, can cause fast and significant burns, but then x-rays can do it as well. This is the real radiation area. And it follows that, keep in mind, this is visible light in here, and it's getting longer and longer and more and more harmless, more and more harmless. Oh, there's the mobile phones. So it's not even remotely. Then we're going down here to, well, for those of you who like such things, the low frequency resonant earth waves, which aren't exactly going to kill you because they're around us all the time. So uh, I regard the electromagnetic spectrum below the visible section. I regard that all as completely safe. So we've 
covered that, we've covered that, we've covered that. The phones, the fact that because the, the phones are close to the little repeaters right there is the thing. Here is, uh, let's bring another bit of paper. Let's get this out of the way. Here is your house. Your house has multiple rooms in it. And it's got a room there, and it's got a room there, and yeah, there's a wee corridor there, and there's a room up there, and there's a room there, and there's the kitchen, and there's the toilet. Uh, and you put the Wi-Fi router in here. Your Wi-Fi router or router, that's this thing which is transmitting at the same frequency as your microwave oven, but at very low power, and 5 gigahertz, which is coincidentally above the frequency of 5G communication with your phone. I just thought I'd mention it. This has already been transmitting above the frequency of 5G and at roughly the same power levels for a very, very long time into the past. But anyway, it's in there and it's beaming around and fine, you're sitting in the toilet, you're, you're using your phone in the toilet, it's fine. But you go into the wee cupboard at the end here or a bedroom and because there's walls in the way, you end up with a low signal because the signal isn't quite reaching there. It's just so many walls in the way that it doesn't give you a strong signal. That is the problem with those frequencies. They're very, very directional. The advantage of them is much more data, but the problem is that they are very directional. They can't penetrate through walls as easy as the longer waves. And this is where the problem with the 5G comes out. And this is why they're talking about putting uh, little towers outside with uh, some panels around them, projecting low power, like little Wi-Fi. Imagine a group of these in waterproof boxes to keep them dry, mounted around a pole, and in a sort of neighbourhood, you've got a house over there, you've got a house over there, you've got a house down here. So they're just transmitting low power signals, low power signal, low power signal, low power signal. And that's the reason that they have to have lots more of these. They can't use a remote tower anymore. They have to have lots of these little units. And this is where the thing about streetlights came from. Because there's this rumour that streetlights have 5G death beams built into them. Firstly, they're not death beams. Let's talk about the 300 gigahertz bit that I, I've got a theory about where they're going to use that. Because the 300 gigahertz is probably going to be very, very directional. If you have a tower, it's probably going to be used by the telecommunication companies to beam that signal between towers so they can actually just communicate between towers without wires. You could compare that, that if this was the C, and there was a boat on the sea with its uh, with its wheelhouse sticking up. And there's a big rock here and there's a lighthouse on top of the rock. And it projects the beam out. And the boat can see the beam of light. Um, the power required is not super mega high. Um, if you're right up next to the... the uh, if you were on the little balcony that goes round those, you'd probably feel that as the lighthouse rotated round, it's projecting that beam out for quite some distance, you'd probably feel some level of heat on from that. And the same applies to these towers, but probably not even remotely close to the old television towers. You could literally cook a sausage by holding it in front of the antenna in those old towers because they were covering vast cities with one beacon. But in this case, it's only having to communicate from beacon to beacon and... By the time the light gets to that boat down there, it's they're not going to feel any heat off it. They're just going to see a glowing dot in the distance, and that's the equivalent of what these are going to be. So it's going to be very directional, but it is going to fan out. It's not like a laser beam. It's not like some coherent, that's where the death beam concept comes from. All that terror there is looking for is that glimmer of light from that. And the signal strength will be close, will be quite strong up close, but as you get further away, it gets lower. And it's not beaming that down into the cities. It's not blasting 300 gigahertz death beams into the cities. Now let's talk about the streetlights. Let's talk about an individual on the internet who's making a bit of a name for himself. And I don't know if he's genuinely naive. I don't know if he's looking for attention or he's looking to make money out of conspiracy theories. But this guy has spread misinformation about lamp posts containing death beams. Now, the I mentioned earlier how the 5G doesn't have a very, you know, they have to go for lots of low power repeaters just beaming to local houses. And with that in mind, in the same way that they used the old power line uh, poles to actually support 
telephone poles as well. You know, you see the power line poles and they've got the high voltage strung across the top, but they also have loops of your local telephone cable slung underneath in the same way. They're talking about using those same poles to put little clusters of the Wi-Fi repeaters around. These little 5G repeaters that are putting out roughly the same frequency as this little unit here, but uh, lots of them just dotted around the poles. And they've also talked about doing it in lampposts. And I have to say the first ones that I've seen, they're not lampposts at all. They basically, they're a pole and they, I suppose, yeah, it's got a light in the end. But then they've got this big cluster of boxes in the control gear. And the reason the boxes are so big is largely because they're they're designed to be easy to service. They're designed to be reliable. They they transmit to lots of houses at once and they've they've got to be waterproof. So it makes them look quite bulky. But that's possibly where this is coming from, because one concept of the future was that that LED light could look like this. It could have the box, it could have the the bit that actually fires the light out, but it could have the antennas on top and they could have doubled up using them for providing the 5G to local houses. But in reality, I don't know of a single street light with 5G transmitter built into it. Um, it would effectively be a, a repeater, the the uh, lights would be communicating with each other at low power and then they'd be spreading that signals to the house and it would be two-way communication. But when you see a lamp, a street light, with either you've got that little pointy thing on top of it or you've got a little pointy antenna or both, here's what they actually are because they're not 5G death beams. The little dome thing is one of these. It's a, either a light sensor or it's a blanking plug that goes onto the light sensor and actually shorts it out so that control can be handed over to either a time switch or this little antenna. And this little antenna is a system whereby they use little bursts of data at very low power to communicate with local stations or that again they can communicate with each other and then send that data back to a main control point. And it means that Cities can control all the street lighting from one central place, and it means that instead of that situation that a light sensor fails, or um, it means it can control precisely when the lighting comes on and off. It's a, just a simple way of doing that. It also means that if something goes pop in here and the light goes out, um, the unit, if the unit is left powered, it can send a signal back, just low power signal that says, this light's failed, please send an engineer out to fix me or replace me. That's what that's about. And some of the things that that guy is saying, he's showing you modules out of them. He's opening them up and pointing at all the components. I'm not going to name the guy because I don't want to give him the attention he's seeking because he's a dick. I honestly don't know if he's naive or he's looking for attention or he's looking to make money. He's now giving presentations and presenting himself as an engineer. I can tell you right now he's not an engineer in any stretch of imagination. All the things he's talking about in these modules is absolute a pile of crap. So he says, for instance, look at the size. This is an LED driver, but this is the one in the streetlight. So what's the difference? Why is this one so big? It's because it's to power the energy weapons that are going to like cause brain tumours and things like that. Here's the real reason that it's got all these components, because this is very similar to the driver in a streetlight. Let's start at the very beginning. This is a cheap power supply. This is an expensive power supply. This is very basic. It's very little filtering. It's got a terrible power factor, which means that it's going to cost more to run in terms of electrical cabling and power usage, apparent power usage. This one has unity power factor or near unity. It's power factor corrected. It's well filtered. It's a professional unit. It's got overrated components. This one was incidentally sent by Rod. Sorry, Rod. I will eventually get around taking a look at this. But let's compare them. The main supply comes in, there's a fuse, there's an NTC inrush limiter to limit the current, and then there's very basic filtering, that's it. This one has incoming supply, filtering to ground, it's got the fuse, inrush limiter, it's got a class X2 capacitor which acts a little reservoir like a water tank that removes noise. Then it's got a com mode suppression choke, which is a much bigger version than that one, which uh, allows the, the normal mains current to flow in and out. But if common mode noise comes out, it actually pushes back against it magnetically. It creates a sort of back EMF against it. Then, hidden in there, we've got more uh, suppression. We've got another X2 capacitor. Then we've got the bridge rectifier. Then more filtering and more filtering and more filtering. And then a choke that is used to 
spread the load by pulsing it to charge this capacitor it spreads the load over the whole sine wave as a series of pulses as opposed to this one which draws its load entirely as a peak in the middle of the sine wave this is why they're so big and complex after that it finally gets down to the final bit it's got the uh, transformer that couples the dc across as a series of pulses it just pulses magnetically couples across and then there's a bit of filtering the output they both have that and then it goes to the load that's why one power supply is much bigger than the other. It's designed not just for reliability. It's designed to filter all that noise out. Is there anything else to say about that? Yes, there is. That guy, who I'm not going to name, uh, is harassing street lighting operatives. And because he's basically creating this rumour, this malicious just, I don't even know how to describe it. It's ridiculous. It's beyond belief. Because he's creating this malice towards the street lighting industry, it's only a matter of time before somebody attacks a street lighting engineer just fixing a light, claiming that they're putting up a death beam weapon. Or in America, it could be someone shooting at a street lighting operative. And if that happens, then, you know, the street lighting operative was the innocent factor here. It's the, it's these people that are spreading the malice for their own personal attention because they're just not technically capable of understanding the reality of the technology involved and um, they will be responsible for that death when it happens and it's almost certainly going to happen if they keep on the way they're going and burning down the communication towers they're setting fire to masts and the control panels and cabling they're basically damaged the communication system which is also knocking out part of the emergency system and at this time that's quite important you know as we go through this current pandemic as i record this video so this is what it's all about it's unimpressive. Um, but there we go. What can you do? Uh, so that's my take on 5G. I regard it as being completely safe. Um, yes, fi op fiber optic to all the houses is great as well. But 5G is actually safer as far as I'm concerned than all the previous phone standards.